Every semester we have a new crop of students who join us in the laboratory, so we need to build their skills. They come to us from many different fields, mainly graduate students who are starting on their dissertation research, and we always start with a historical cooking recipe reconstruction. So we find several obscure recipes. The students work in groups, and we ask them to decipher the recipe, what the materials are, what the object of the recipe is, what processes are needed, what kind of heat, and there aren't usually very precise measurements either. Usually measurements are given in ratios, which is very interesting. And that's one of the aims of this skill building exercise, is to actually make them think about how do you do a reconstruction? What is the aim of this reconstruction? Is it to produce something? Is it to explore the process? Is it to figure out what these materials are? Is it a form of close reading? And they need to keep very detailed field lab notes. We do a kind of hybrid type of lab and field notes. And then they bring their product into the class. So we've had, for example, snow. <laughs> snow is actually a kind of meringue which is poured over fruits and things in the 17th century. We've had excellent mustard. We've had an excellent cake. So the students prepare a presentation on their process, and out of those presentations, we formulate a reconstruction template or a set of guidelines which guides the students for the rest of the semester in reconstructions. And then we eat the products, if they're safe. From historical culinary recipe uh, reconstruction, we go on to some of the things that are found in the manuscript. For example, bread molding. And this is an exercise for the students of learning to make bread. <laughs> there are very, very few recipes for French bread, um, well, for French bread, for any kind of bread at this period, uh, because, of course, everybody knew how to make it, or you bought it from your baker. So they have made bread molds. This is a recipe in the manuscript for making bread molds in order to test out a sculptural pattern or a pattern for a portrait metal or something like that. And this is another unlikely process. But in fact, you get tremendous detail. The author practitioner advises pouring wax and sulfur to test out the pattern. In the first year, we had a group of students working on many of the sulfur and wax casting recipes in the manuscript for adding pigments to the um, sulfur and wax in order to make it a better way of seeing what kind of detail you could get. And then the really interesting kinds of recipes were those that tried to change the properties of wax and sulfur, especially the sulfur past wax. You put sulfur chunks into molten beeswax, and what it produces is a wonderful, very milky wax that is, in fact, remains extremely flexible. You can actually manipulate it with your hands after the wax has set. Uh, so other skill building exercises that we've done have been preparing a canvas from linen, sewing it, stretching it on a frame, and then producing a small detail of a still life. And we've also actually prepared a wood panel painting with nine layers of gesso made from rabbit skin glue and champagne chalk. And it took them about 10 days to actually produce the panel, but it's a beautifully smooth panel when it's finished. So these are just some of the ways that we take them through the skill building portion of the course. It takes about six or seven weeks. We usually have an expert practitioner come in to lead us in these exercises. So this is just one example of the way that the students go from the kind of skill building that we provide and then they find their own focus of research, often with very, very interesting results.